Hello, and welcome to an installment of the FIT Soul Club Oral History Project, a program of the Fashion Institute of Technology, one of 64 campuses of the State University of New York. This project is generously funded by FIT President Joyce F. Brown through her Diversity Grant Program Initiative. The Soul Club of FIT was created and organized by community member Clara Branch in 1968, after the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. I'm Tor Orange, Director of the Office of Educational Opportunity Programs. The resulting interview will be made available via the FIT Library's online video platform called Archive On Demand. The digital file and its transcription will become part of the official college archives. The library's unit of special collections and college archives administers the FIT oral history programs. We are coming to you today from the FIT campus on West 27th Street in Manhattan, New York City, USA. It is January 25th, 2023, and the time is 1020. We have the honor and privilege to be joined today by Gwenviria Sargent. Gwen, welcome to the program and thank you for participating. And I hope you appreciate my true New York roots by saying Manhattan instead of Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tor. My thank true you for having New York me. City roots. <laughs> Not we, a problem at all. We've known one another for <laughs> uh, for quite some time. Yes. And um, and so it's it's a pleasure to be on this end of of things <laughs> it's just a pleasure to be you. first of all talking to you okay <laughs> face to face come on come on no it's <laughs> it's such a pleasure it really is so i mean as i mentioned in the introduction this is a project uh that the library archives have um really been committed to mm -hmm. they stumbled upon some old footage I, I believe from the 1980s mm -hmm. of uh, Soul Club fashion shows that sparked some curiosity mm. and um, and the rest is history. Wow. And so um, I was very honored to be asked to mm -hmm. join in interviewing mm -hmm. those of you who were here at the college, mm -hmm. those of you who may have participated in the Soul Club itself, yes, and certainly those who participated in the fashion shows. Absolutely. Uh, so, so share a little bit for the viewing audience about Gwenveria. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm a native of Syracuse, New York, and uh, my we'll, mother. We'll forgive you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. A state girl. I'm one of the only people that you'll meet that was actually born and raised in Syracuse mm. and didn't just go to college there mm. or know someone, a cousin or sister or brother went to college there. I was born and raised, and I'm uh, the youngest of four. Uh, and, uh, my name, uh, my mother named me, uh, Gwenveria because her, uh, she was, uh, one of nine and the youngest was Gwen. And so she named me after my aunt Gwen and she was Gwendolyn. My mother is being the creative person that she is a Leo, like I am, uh, <laughs> decided to switch it a little bit and make it Gwenveria. So, but anyway, uh, she taught me how to sew, um, Auntie or so mom? my mom taught me how to sew. So I knew how to sew, but I learned how to draw in high school um, in Syracuse. We didn't have any fashion classes or anything, but my home economics teacher uh, taught me um, how to design from scratch to make uh, the project for to come to FIT to put my portfolio together. And so I made this jacket from scratch with my home economics teacher being my instructor. And to learn how to sketch, I just sketched what I saw uh, in art class. Uh, some of us who were interested in fashion would have some of the students who were in between classes or they had a free period and they would stand on the table and they would pose for us and we would sketch them. Um, not really knowing what to do, uh, not having formal fashion illustration instruction, um, I guess I was uh, pretty handy at being able to draw. So I pulled together a, a nice portfolio, knew how to sew, and I was able to be, let me just say, first of all, 
I wasn't a straight A student. Mm -hmm. And so on my first uh, attempt to enter into the college, I was not accepted. Mm -hmm. um, however, mm -hmm. I guess my personality, thank God, <laughs> was such that I went to my guidance counselor and spoke with them. I was so disappointed because it was one of the only schools I had really applied to. I knew I wanted to be a fashion designer. And uh, uh, that guidance counselor spoke to the college and they reconsidered me and accepted me into the college. So that was uh, that's one thing I tell all of my students uh, today. Just persevere. You just never know. Uh, you know because and, and they must not have had me OP program. <laughs> well, you know, at the time, I didn't even know, you know about right, EOP. Right. At the time, I didn't know. But I certainly did. We did have the Pell Grants and all of that. We had certain grants that were able to help me to, because uh, I was uh, raised by a single parent. Uh, so, and uh, so I was very happy to be able to live on campus and, uh, and get my associate's degree from uh, the college and fashion design, a sportswear major. What okay. was it like for your mother mm. to learn, to hear that you had been accepted? Well, she was excited, of course. Uh, my mother was uh, very excited, um, that I was, but terrified for me. Because you have to remember, mm -hmm. this was mid-70s, getting ready to be early 80s. Coming into For New her York baby City. girl to be coming into New York City. Mm -hmm. So I think she was a little bit nervous, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. But I think she was proud of me and and just, you know, had a lot of faith in God and therefore, you know, encouraged me to just do my best. Yeah. Ha, ha, what's your sense of what your mother's vision, or, or I should say not so much her vision, what her aspirations were for herself? Mm, for herself. Because very often mm -hmm. our parents... Right. Indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, funnel that to That's us. That's true. I see that a lot now with my students. Say, yeah. Right. And it's interesting that you asked that. I really don't know if she, by the time she got to me, the fourth one, single parent mom. They bury their aspirations. You know, she's just like, whatever, you know, just as long as you make it through and uh, and you become something, you know, whatever you want to do, basically. And I think she encouraged me. She knew I could sew. She had no idea of what it was to really be a fashion designer because we didn't have the fashion industry in Syracuse. So she worked for a little while at a department store and uh, where she used to sew a little bit for them. But she had gone on to get her degree in social work. So my mother was an activist. She was very involved in what was happening with civil rights. As a matter of fact, she was working for a crusade for opportunity in Syracuse, mm -hmm. New York, mm -hmm. and legal services, you know, as working with the people in social and dealing with social issues. So she was more involved in that. But she always did like alterations for people. You know, by the time I had graduated from high school, she was doing, she had her own little business, uh, come by and see Vi. Her name's Viola. And uh, she would do little fashion shows and stuff. So she was still doing her thing with her craft of what she knew how to do. And uh, eventually, by the time I was graduating um, uh, from high school, she was working, doing alterations in the cleaners um, mm -hmm. part time. Uh, she had been um, the director of Peace Incorporated, which is a nonprofit in Syracuse. So back and forth with the mm -hmm. fashion. And uh, so but for me, um, you know, it was like, go for it. No one in my family had aspired, had, had even been a part of the fashion industry. So it was all brand new. As a matter of fact, I was encouraged to become a fashion designer because of the um, <clears throat> the fashion shows that we would see. The ebony fashion shows. That was my first exposure to real fashion, runway fashion. Say, say a little bit about what Ebony was. Oh, yeah. Uh, be, because that's a frame of reference for yes, our generation. Yes. May not be for all viewers. Right. <laughs> well, the Ebony fashion shows, if you didn't experience them, you know, it's just like some of the great music we had back in the day. You really missed out. Um, it was so wonderful. Eunice Johnson, who was the wife of John Johnson. John Johnson. Mm -hmm. And they are. Uh, was the editor-in-chief. Editor-in-chief of, of Jet Magazine. Old, yes. 
Yes. And Ebony Magazine. Yeah. And both of them, I think, are still publishing today. I think both of them. I know Ebony is. I believe Jet is. But anyway, it was in everybody's dining room table. <laughs> in every black home in America, there was Jet and Ebony Magazine. You best believe that. Okay? And in those magazines, they would have the schedule of the fashion shows and what communities they were coming to. And they would go to every city across the United States. From New York to California, from down south to up north. I don't know how many places in the Midwest, but I do know that they were everywhere and they came to Syracuse and they would come to like uh, the Civic Center or whatever. They, as a matter of fact, I remember the high school that I attended. That's where they came. Uh, the last show that I remember going to was at my high school auditorium. So they would come in and be like a community thing that we would all pay money and Pay our, and get dressed up, honey, and go to these fashion shows. And I would see Audrey Schmaltz was the commentator. And Richard Roundtree was one of the models. The and, actor. And yeah, the, yeah, the actor Richard Roundtree. <clears throat> and Audrey was doing the commentating. And she was just fabulous. And I don't know if it was Pat Clean, Probably Billy Blair and some of the other models from back in the day were modeling in the Ebony Fashion Fair at that time. Uh, but that was so exciting. The music. And the clothes would all be from Europe. Eunice Johnson would go over and buy uh, collections from Dior and Givenchy and these people. And we didn't know who these people were, had no idea. But she would bring European fashions worn by black uh, models. And it was a whole show, a black show. And it was just showed me how wonderful, how exciting it would be to be a part of this fashion community. So that's really what sparked me to go a little further than just, uh, you know, working in a factory or something like that. Well, no, I want to be a designer. And when my high school teachers, the two of them, I'll give them credit. My art teacher, she encouraged me. She said, well, okay, let's put a portfolio together. And my home economics teacher, I said, could you help me, uh, you know, do some garments that for my portfolio and, you know, be my mentor. She was absolutely, and so she Do worked independently. Their names? Oh, Mrs. Wilson, I believe, okay. was okay. my home economics teacher at okay. uh, Nottingham High School, mm -hmm. and I I don't remember Mrs. Bart. I think was uh, my art teacher. It's mm -hmm. interesting when you talk about your mom doing alterations mm -hmm. in the cleaners because mm -hmm. I recall growing up mm -hmm. uh, and and becoming aware that that was a path. Mm -hmm. For, for black men and women yes. who had the talent and skill mm -hmm. of sewing. Yes. That was pretty much the only path mm -hmm. forward, mm -hmm. was to assist yes. in a cleaners. Yes. Everyone had a neighborhood cleaners. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and to be responsible for the alterations. Oh, yeah. But when you were a good, a good mm -hmm. person with alterations, mm -hmm. everyone in the community knew That's your name right. and your reputation. That's right. Everyone. <laughs> and so to think that, that the, that the, um, that the opportunities have widened yes. for their mm -hmm. children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren mm -hmm. to actually participate in industry, mm -hmm. not just in the back of a cleaners, right. uh, is amazing. Mm -hmm. Is amazing. Yeah, it's wonderful. So fast forward to FIT. Mm -hmm. um, what was the experience? Like? So I'm on campus. I'm with uh, a roommate. They gave me a roommate who was from Philadelphia, Celia Carmichael. <laughs> and uh, so they paired us up. She was, you know, from... Uh, a similar type of family as mine. I thought that was a good uh, pairing up that they did. And we got along really well. And we lived in Nagler Hall and uh, the all girls uh, dormitory here on campus. Uh, first of all, I almost didn't get a space on campus because, you know, it's not a lot of space on campus here at FIT. They didn't have the extra building that they have now on 31st Street. It was only the two, the co ed building and Nagler Hall. And, uh, but as God would have it, I thought I was going to have to live in some place on, you know, 34th Street. There was some place that they recommended <clears throat> that I could possibly live. Uh, but they found space for me. So that was great. Um, she was an FBM major, fashion buying and merchandising. So we weren't two fashion design majors. Uh, but we complemented each other well. And we clung to a group of people. There was some friends from... Uh, Connecticut, Jamie from K Connecticut, and we had different people from uh, like uh, Cleveland. Some of our friends were from just all around. And so we had a nice little group 
of friends and we kind of cling to each other because none of us were from New York. Mm -hmm. And so when we would walk the streets, we would walk together mm -hmm. and we would go down to the garage to party in the weekends, that garage, that uh, nightclub that didn't open up until midnight. <laughs> and we would be there all night dancing. All morning. All morning. <laughs> and... Um, the, you know, we garage. would walk down there because we couldn't, you know, we couldn't afford the subway was it would take too much money to get down there. And we would, uh, you know, walk down there and walk back from the campus. It's great. What 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 period? What years that are we talking? It was got to be like uh, 78, you know, 77, 78. Yeah, because I was a bicentennial graduate, mm -hmm. um, 17, uh, 1976. So it was somewhere like around there. Mm -hmm. um, the black community here at FIT. Okay, the black community. Was there? There was. Mm -hmm. There was, but it, there, it's interesting because, again, I wasn't um, from New York City per se. So my community was more mixed, just like where I grew up in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. I grew, I always went to mixed schools. I had no, no concept of being in a segregated school situation. So college was very normal for me to have interracial friends, mm -hmm. you know, and to not to have a problem with having friends of all races. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, but there was certain kinship type of feeling when you came across another uh you know, person of color who kind of came up like you did in the church or whatever, and you could relate to them. They reminded you of your cousins and things of that nature. Um, but on campus, it wasn't about race. <laughs> it was about getting that work done because mm. the fashion design mm. program is not a game. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will say though, that there were no black instructors, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what did that translate into? But guess what? We were used to that. But, but what did that translate into? Well, what it was, it was normal. The only black instructor was Miss Clara Branch. And she wasn't, in fact, in a classroom giving us instruction, but she was running the fabric room, okay, and it was, uh, and I didn't know her from the Soul Club initially. I knew her when I would go there because, I, of course, I didn't have money to go buy fabric. <laughs> but if you didn't have money to go buy fabric in the fabric stores, you could go to Miss Clara Branch's room and you could get fabric. Mm. So she would be there and you could get trims and you could get fabric. And, it, you know, it was great to be able to have her there, you know, for that. And I do know that she ran a very strict situation there. You couldn't come in there and cut up and act any kind of way. And, you know, you had to leave the place in a certain type of way. Everything was orderly. Everything was organized. And, uh, you know, I got that. You got that feeling when you walked in the door. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was different from having a, uh, we had, I remember having Italian instructors and Jewish instructors and even Hispanic uh, instructors uh, and professors, but no black, I don't remember any black instructors. So what that meant for me was um, just more of the same, more of the same. <laughs> <laughs> Which means? <laughs> well, it um, just means that they may not know me as well as, uh, but I think they treated me because I was good. Mm. <laughs> mm. I, felt I was treated with respect because I was engaged. I was a good student. You know, I was a straight A student still, but I worked hard. Mm -hmm. I was serious about what I was doing. I knew that it was an honor to be here. <clears throat> I didn't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I would get pretty good grades, you know, mm -hmm. I would. <laughs> and I knew how to sew already and I was helpful with the other students and everything. So 
that was okay. It was okay for me. I, the reason why I pressed the mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. is because I arrived at FIT in, uh, I, I think I've stopped counting, <laughs> maybe 82, mm, okay. 83. Okay. And I remember having students, I was doing advisement at that time, mm -hmm. and I remember having students of color mm. um, feeling broken. Mm, wow. Um, and, and sharing stories about having croakies of color. Oh, yeah. Being rejected. Oh, wow. Having professors say, uh, this is this is really has some potential. This is really good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but let's not let's not put any color on this. Mm. And them internalizing that mm. as you really don't see me. Right. And so if you don't see me, you don't see my vision mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. who is wearing this. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I heard that for years. Mm -hmm. I heard wow. that for years. So I was just curious whether yeah. or not and I still you came saved. earlier. Yeah, I saved some. I still have some of my illustrations from uh, from from school here, and uh, I I know that I did them in all colors. <laughs> yeah, and some of the you know the markers. I mean, were really really dark. Um, and uh, I guess I was fortunate. Mm. Mm. I guess I was fortunate to have instructors that didn't show me, you know, bias a bias that. towards that. Uh -huh. Didn't give me uh -huh. a problem with that. It was just mm -hmm. whether or not that flare was uh, illustrated correctly or did you do that ruffle correctly? Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I felt freedom, uh, create, creative in the way that I would even do my croquis, you know. Uh, and, but I felt comfortable. That was my strong suit illustration. Yeah, that was my strong suit. Even more so than sewing, oh, yeah, which much was more, your much your more start. so. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh. much more so. Uh -huh. I think I I found out early on that I could draw, you know, pretty good. I could draw anything that I saw, and then when I saw different techniques of how you could uh, render the fabrics and everything, it was great. How I could, you could do different faces and different hairstyles and everything, uh, I took it on very came very easily for me. So. Um, yeah, so that was good. What did you see in terms of the, <laughs> the fashion shows? Well, I want and, you to and what know. what role do you think it played? Okay, I did try out <laughs> to be one of those models for the Soul Club show. And um, I wasn't tall enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't tall, quite tall enough. Mm -hmm. So I had to give up that dream of being a model. <laughs> <laughs> So, but that was okay because I always really wanted to design anyway. It was more important for me to actually be the one who designs the garments, you know. Um, but uh, to, the shows were great. Uh, there was a variety of, of color. And I don't know if I remember the regular shows versus the Soul Club shows uh -huh. Uh -huh. so much. Mm -hmm. When you say the regular shows, meaning the fashion shows that we would have when we graduated, the yeah, the college would sponsor. have, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. totally, it was different. You would have, you would have one or two black models in those shows, um, I believe, and um, but the, the Soul Club shows were so, you know, they just were describe spicy. It. I mean, <laughs> <clears throat> it was just like, uh, I mean, the the music. Uh, it's such a groove and um, the flair of the models. Uh, it was just, you know, very colorful in every way, you know, and um, more entertaining. And, uh, you know, those models got out there and you thought that you were on 7th Avenue, very professional. And it reminded me very much of the Ebony Fashion Show. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. What, what mm. role do you think? Mm -hmm. It played um, in the college at large and for students of color to have that as a venue, as a platform. I think it was great because if I had gone to a different school, I had always, I had been a cheerleader at my other schools, <laughs> you know, in, in, in junior high and high school, I was a cheerleader and I was in gymnastics. So I probably would have gone on and done sports if I had gone to a different uh, type of college, but that was our sport. Mm. Here at FIT, it was the fashion shows. 
and you know the the fashion presentations that would go on the art shows and you know that was our sport now there was a basketball team here that was very good mm -hmm. and i guess i kind of remember going to some of those games mm -hmm. but i wasn't interested in that mm -hmm. <laughs> not at all you know i remember going to the parties they had disco parties downstairs in the basement Second, at Benskis. Yeah, Benskis. Benskis. I remember going and to those parties. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The parties were great. And I mean, fashion, it was just everything. So um, that was our social life, you know. And then, you know, going into the industry, going to the fabric stores, doing it, really exploring uh, uh, the trim stores and everything right here in the city, being so, you know, having that at your access. And then, my God, going to the stores and actually looking at the wonderful clothes and everything. So that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I got a job right away in retail as I was a student. I was working across the street. They had a lot of stores right across the street. Uh, um, I remember working at one of the boutiques right across the street. Where on they, 7th? Right on 7th, 27th? right across from the library. There yeah. were a bunch of yeah. uh, boutique stores. Mm-hmm. I remember getting a job there. It was one store that had a couple of floors, and I was very fortunate to to get a job there. They had a lot of stores, little stores, you know, dress shops and things of that nature. So I was very fortunate. It, it was truly the garment district. Then. Yes. Oh yeah. It's kind of dissipated a little. Oh yeah, totally, totally. It's more. It's a touristy thing. It's mm -hmm. all about the tourists now, and you know, souvenir shops and things of that nature, uh, you know. But that fabric store that was on the corner for many, many years was mm -hmm. there when I was mm -hmm. going to school here. That was a store on 25th Street, I believe. It's, and it's moved Avenue. in, you know. Oh, it's moved so in? It, so it left that corner. Uh -huh. um, I think the original, well, I don't know the original, but someone passed away. Oh. And the son took it over oh, okay. and they abandoned the corner, which is not like a coffee shop, okay. but it's moved a little bit in the I block in small space. So it's still there. Oh, good. That's yeah. good to know. He's held on to it. Oh, that's great to know. <laughs> Just like Steinloff and Stoller down in, on 38th, they were on 39th Street for many years. Sherry talked about that. And, um, and they are on 39th still Street. Still hanging in. Now. Yeah. The son, I think, also. Yes, the son. Again. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, that was the day when we could, uh, those were the days when there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of uh, garment stores, fashion stores, and uh, not so much anymore. Mm. <laughs> mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what will you remember FIT for? What will I remember FIT for? Um. I mean, you're still very connected yes. in many ways. Yes, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's been a full circle for me uh, because I have to say that FIT prepares you for the industry. I say that uh, because I've worked in the industry for many years. And um, it really prepared me um, as a professional uh, to know how to spec, you know, to respect the construction of garments, uh, to know the quality of fabrics. Um, it really gave me a great start um, to work for uh, to work for another firm. What it does not prepare you for, and back then, I don't know what it's doing now. I think they have some other kind of courses. But to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it will you can acquire the the skills. I mean, like I said, drawing came kind of easy to me. Uh, but I always thought that the kids from Parsons, who came out of Parsons, really knew how to draw. I don't know the ones that I've met. All right, amazing. Uh, and and fashion industries high school will teach you how to make a pattern and how to sew if that's what you want to do. Um, but I was kind of disappointed in the fact that they got rid of the pattern making degrees. Everything is gone Certificate. to tech mm -hmm. and everything. And also I found out that I was 
discouraged to find that in some of the fashion high schools here, one of the fashion high schools here, they didn't really encourage the kids to become fashion designers. They encouraged them to become pattern makers. And I didn't find that out until I started teaching, you know, after being a designer. And um, so now I, I don't know what to say as far as, uh, you know, the industry is changing so much. It's not like it used to be at all. Um, yes, sir. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's shrinking. Um, it is shrinking so much. We used to, when I first came out, I was able to make a pattern and cut it out. And even tell the seamstress how to sew it up. But that's what FIT, you know, prepared me for. Um, and to know the, the way that a, a Peter Pan collar is supposed to lay and the proper flow of a flared skirt or the difference, you know, all the different silhouettes and the different fabrics and such. Um, but the, I think that the, the, the students and um, I don't know about all the designers, but it seems like to me they're, they're more influenced by what they've already seen in the stores or what they're already seeing by what other people are wearing instead of creating things. Mm -hmm. And we were taught to create mm -hmm. from our imaginations, but and then also to know who your customer is that you're actually designing for, that you're not just designing for you. Mm -hmm especially when you're to work in the industry, you have to know who your customer is, you know, and what they like to wear. But it, it, it becomes complicated because once you get in the industry, the manufacturers are so desperate to sell the product that they will go and buy a couple of samples from their competitor or someone that they aspire to be, a company that they inspire to be like. And try to replicate And they it. will tell you to just knock it off. Wow. wow, wow so wow. all of your creative juices wow. that you've been, you know, acquiring <laughs> and so ready to uh, put out there. Uh, There's not even the space for it. Man, they're not interested and they, don't, they just want to know, you know, can you knock this off? <laughs> you know, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really great when you're able to work for a company and you put together a collection and you're able to see it in the stores. There's nothing like it to see your designs actually being worn by someone yeah. that you actually designed the fabric and the, you know, I mean, there's nothing like that. Nothing like it. So it is a great thing. I'm glad I had the experience of doing that on a mass scale. Um, you know, me being the type of person that I am anyway, um, I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. So I went from working at a number of different mom and pop shops on Broadway, 7th Avenue. I've worked for so many of them. Uh, 7th Avenue, Broadway, 7th Avenue, Broadway, back and forth, blouses, children's wear, women's wear, Missy mm -hmm. sports wear. Um, you know, so I, I've been fortunate to have that experience of working for firms in the industry and actually getting jobs in the industry uh, and working as a designer. Um, so it, it that industry has been good to me. FIT was a result of that. I think getting a degree is very important. I think people don't respect uh, the degree that a lot of people coming up today think that, oh, you know, and especially with this DIY stuff going on, mm. you know. Uh, everybody thinks that they can be a designer and it doesn't help when the celebrities all turn around and says, yes, I designed this. I designed, they didn't even take a night class, you know, but yet but they're, they their name. you know, but they put their name on that yes. label. Yes. So, yes. It, you know, it's kind of, you know, you, it's very interesting to see what's happening with fashion now. Um, but I say that uh, when people ask me about FIT versus other colleges, I, you know, really relish my experience here. I have some lifetime friends, you know, that I, uh, you know, made, started the friendship from being here at FIT uh, that are still friends today mm. with me, which is a blessing. 40 years out. Yes, it, it is a blessing. What would you tell students of color now that you wish you had been told 40 years ago? 
Hmm. I would say, you know, work hard, be, you know, be determined um, and uh, be adaptable. Be adaptable. Don't get stuck in one area, you know, uh, just because you like to do dresses, be open mm. to being able to do blouses, be open to being able to design a children's wear collection, be flexible, be adaptable, uh, and then you'll have longevity. Uh, that's what I think. And as well as being like a sponge. And what do you wish you had been told 40 years ago when you were here? Uh, what do I wish that I had been told? I wish that I had been told that you need to be... Uh, business minded you need mm, to mm. you need to be a good business you need to have a good head business head on your shoulders it's not just how creative you are in order for you to be successful uh in the industry and and also i wish that i had been encouraged to have my own company earlier on mm -hmm. instead of not being encouraged and kind of kind of figuring it out for myself. Well, why can't I have my own company? I was, and I think a lot of us were trained to go work for someone else. Go get a good company. Go work for Liz Claiborne. <laughs> go work for Jones of New York. Go get a good company. Go be a good designer there. And then learn, I found out later on, mm -hmm. learn how they do the business. Get your education beyond college in the industry at one of those companies. And then you'll be able to branch out and have run your own independent company the way I wish that I had um, had that plan in mind, mm -hmm. but I'm okay with the way things turned out. Mm -hmm. But if I had that mindset going into it, I think things might've been a little different mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. <laughs> Any question you have not been asked? Oh boy! <laughs> I should. <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, I well, you know what? I didn't know, and that I just want to just say that Miss Claire Branch, you know, as we talk about the the significance of. Uh, the contribution of blacks in the fashion industry. That's the other thing. I wish that, you know, because the only black designers that we were um, focusing on at the time in the 70s, and the, the only black designers that were allowed to be in the uh, in the industry were like Willie Smith. Um, well, there was Scott Berry, Willie Smith, mm -hmm. you know, um, well, I don't know how hard of a, of a time that they had with it. And few women. Of there color. were hardly any black female designers, period. Right. Really. That, that is very sad to say. Um, but, you know, we, you know, we were always very, there was some, some very, very creative, very, very talented people. And they came around a little, even a little later, like Patrick Kelly. You know, we discovered him, you know, um, as being very talented. He had to go over to Europe in order to really get the type of accolades that he really shouldn't have had to go to Europe to get. Um, so uh, that's what I do now, you know, with the Fashion Arts Exchange Group. I would just like to say that. Mm -hmm. That's why I feel, maybe that's why I feel the need. I felt the need 20 plus years ago. Uh, we pulled the, together this organization, the Fashion Arts Exchange Group. Um, FAX is the yeah, acronym. Yeah, FAX is the acronym. F-A-X. Um, so that there could be a synergy because the FIT might have prepared me how to do the work, you know, from the ground floor. Um, but nothing really prepares you to deal with uh, racism that you deal with 
and working in a working environment. I'm not going to say that nothing, some something could have prepared you if people would even acknowledge that it was going on, you know, and that it wasn't fair. But again, it's just the way things were. You might not have gotten the job that you would have gotten if you didn't, if, if I didn't look the way that I looked, I might have been able to get that job at Liz Claiborne that I didn't get. I don't know. Some of my friends did work at some of those types of companies, so I can't put it on that. But I do know wherever I was working uh, in the industry or anywhere, this is anywhere else too, um, you know, it was like you couldn't be caught at the water fountain talking to the other one other black person that was at the company. You know, there were certain types of things that, you know, um, that you really couldn't do. Um, you didn't feel comfortable doing. Um, and you, I found myself being very isolated at these companies that I would work at because there weren't many people of color there. And if they were, they weren't on the same level I was fortunate to be on, you know, so I didn't have a lot of my own peers once I got into the industry. So, and this is another thing that, that people of color grow accustomed to. And normalize. And normalize it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But there's a thin line between, um, you know, um, demanding a certain amount of respect. And um, even though you have to deal with certain things, but still, you know, be able to demand a certain amount of respect uh, from your peers and from your uh, subordinates and, you know, your supervisors. Uh, and not being considered, you know, angry black person, <laughs> angry black woman. I remember one time uh, one of the salesmen at one of the companies, I was a young designer. And I rem I'll never forget this because uh, he told me, pull me over to the side. He's a Jewish salesman guy. And he was kind of on the young side. I, you know, felt like I could talk to him. And um, he told me, you get more with sugar than you get with salt. <laughs> you don't have to be so abrasive mm. you know um mm. he taught me that and i said okay you know i'll try it that way you know be nice you'll be you'll get further that way i i, I often wonder mm -hmm. uh there, there's certainly a lot to be said about um learning how to be pleasant mm -hmm. in the work environment to get along yeah but I often wonder if uh, not only is it directed at women of color, mm -hmm. but directed at women in general, mm -hmm. that, that we're the ones asked to smile, mm -hmm. that we're the ones asked to make others comfortable. Right. right. Uh, and that men aren't asked that. Mm -hmm. Men aren't asked Interesting. to smile. Interesting, right. Men aren't we're not encouraged to, our, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be sugary instead mm -hmm. of salty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very loaded mm -hmm. kind of dynamic mm -hmm. that continues to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my heart breaks when I think about poor Hillary Clinton oh, boy. being asked to smile. Why the hell does she have to smile? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Well, Obama was asked to smile. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so, so there's a dynamic mm -hmm. that is both um, undergirded by racism mm -hmm. when it's specific to women of color. Mm -hmm. And I think, not but, and I think also that is directed to women in general. In, uh, in general, mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little mm -hmm. mischievous. I always say, as black women, we have a lot to be angry about. Yes. <laughs> yes. We didn't come from the most comfortable uh, and pleasant of, of, uh, of histories mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And so this notion that just grin and bear it is, uh, is offensive to me. Yes, offensive. absolutely. And but, but any final question that you'd like asked? Well, well, no, well, um, as to where do I think, you know, fashion is going now or the situation now, how is it different? I hope that things are uh, on a more equal playing field. Because, um, I mean, it's just been since this whole George Floyd thing, it's been like an awakening of America. You know, finally people understand what we have been trying to say for so long. And it's no longer like, oh, well, you know, you're not a slave anymore, so get over it. <laughs> There's still slave mentality 
out there. Um, a lot of us have become uh, fortunate enough to get degrees and to work in the uh, professional places and uh, to be able to use the same restrooms and uh, eat in the in the restaurants where we want to and everything. Um, but we're still, you know, we still have a long way to come. We still have a long way to go. And I, I just think that it's um, it's important. It's, it, you see it changing. You see things evolving. Uh, but there's still a long way to go as far as uh, people of color getting the acknowledgement that they deserve on the runway. I'd like to become and continue to be an advocate for people of color in the fashion industry. And so I'm hoping that the Fashion Arts Exchange Group uh, will be able to continue to have the chance to do that in a big way and will impact. I know we're already impacting some young lives and helping them uh, to get a leg up you know, uh, and to be able to uh, have a, a, a equal chance at being a part of this industry. Whereas a lot of their, the families of the kids, because I find that some people like maybe a Calvin Klein or somebody like that, who might've had an aunt or a father or a mother who was already in the industry. They're native New Yorkers, so they know what the garment industry is all about. And some of these kids that are so creative and talented, um, their parents don't feel that they would have a chance and they're like, you better go be a nurse or a doctor or something, be a teacher or something, get you a, you know, a safe job, you know, and stop dreaming about becoming a fashion designer. So mm -hmm. I, I just think through programs and, and certainly I love EOP to continue to do that with, uh, for students whose parents can't afford to send them to Saturday live, can't afford to send them to these expensive fashion camps you know, uh, I I just think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I just, you know, would like to continue uh, to do that and to see that, um, you know, happen throughout. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Good to have you. <laughs>